ideas that we have at this point and some of the suggestions that come out of that that we think make sense uh, in terms of viable economic development strategies for this group and for this particular neighborhood. Um, towards the end of our presentation this afternoon, we're going to suggest a few of the next steps that we would like to move forward on based on your reactions to what we talk about today and what that part of the presentation would really involve is something much more interactive in the first 20 minutes or so where we're actually going to talk about what we have learned after we really want to engage in a substantive dialogue with each of you and get as candid uh, feedback as possible to everything that we suggested. So, uh, as Dr. Scavin said, in many ways this particular class exercise for this year was trying to build on the strategic plan for uh, NEON and when we look back at what that document outlined, there were sort of four very powerful goals that were enumerated and that we took as really indicative of our mandate and our charge. Economic development, referring to the creation of jobs and businesses, education and training, uh, addressing perception of the neighborhood and creating a sense of safety within it as being key functions of creating these other goals, and health. Uh, it, it, for us as, as students of planning, uh, it's really an excellent opportunity to interact with people from uh, human and social service agencies and to think of health as a real cornerstone, as a real lens of describing economic and social well-being. And even aside from that, thinking of the tremendous success that Brightwood and other agencies in the uh, North End have had in the ways in which they've created lasting partnerships with other organizations and the ways in which they've been able to raise funds and really make a difference for the residents of the North End. So we wanted to use the experience of the past, the knowledge base built up jointly by NEON and MIT's uh, center and really begin to think about well, what does a population-based approach to economic development look like? What would it look like in this community, in the North End, in the city of Springfield, in the greater Springfield region? And so really beginning after Labor Day with the start of the semester, we've taken as far a plunge as we possibly could, looking at data, looking at qualitative information, looking at mapping, looking at the work product of our colleagues who've gone through this class in years previously, and try to come up with some kind of an analysis, even if it's just the first rough cut, of what the opportunities and constraints for economic development are in this community. And where we are today, sort of signified by the purple oval there is really a sort of an interim review and presentation to you and on the basis of that talking about the next steps and then actually crafting some kind of action plan, figuring out what the sequence of tasks that need to be uh, realized over the next year and beyond that for the community to actually begin to uh, get onto some kind of path of economic progress. Um, so I, I want to sort of hand over now to Alice, who's actually also, I should mention, the project manager for our team. And uh, so if you have complaints about any of us individually, you should take it to her. <laughs> and uh, she's going to talk about some of the findings that, uh, I, let me back up a second, actually. We sort of divided ourselves into three groups around three major components of economic development. Employment and workforce training, business development around small businesses and microenterprises, and real estate development, sort of trying to turn around the physical resources and assets of the neighborhood. And um, what each of us is going to do is just sort of go over what we have found under each of these sections and then make some recommendations of how we can move forward using that information and making the most of the opportunities that exist. So, where Alice is going to start off with is talking about the employment situation in the North End, in the Greater Springfield region, and what some of the opportunities there might be, and the ways in which it links to broader economic development outcomes. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about uh, an employment, I'm not sure that you totally explained it, but we kind of thought of three strategies to look into and 
first one that I think is uh, very commonly associated with economic development is an employment status. And this means both um, identifying and connecting people to jobs, so job search counseling, that kind of thing, as well as um, training and education, workforce development programs. So the goals of an employment strategy are to both connect people to existing jobs, to increase connectivity in the labor market, to connect people to the existing job force, workforce development programs that are out there, and to identify and fill gaps in those um, existing services. So for example, there are um, significant gaps between maybe some training programs and the level of skills that residents currently have, gaps in uh, literacy, English, basic math skills. So addressing some of those skills both makes people more ready to take advantage of jobs and to take advantage of more advanced training programs. Uh, employment opportunity. We've actually done some analysis of the census data out there and the job market that's out there and found that there are actually significant numbers of jobs in Springfield, both that are career oriented, meaning that they have a job ladder, that are good paying, meaning that they're at least $12 an hour, and that are accessible to people without college degrees. So just looking over at some of these industries, the main industries in Springfield being insurance, education, and healthcare, you can see that there are a thousand jobs in the Springfield area right now, every year that come open, that you don't need a college education to get, that you can step on that bottom rung and move up, making more money every year and increasing your benefits. And um, employers are actually having a tough time filling these jobs, which to me says that this is a potentially really impactful way to go. Um, another advantage of the employment take is that it can directly and immediately impact the broadest number of people, which goes back to the population-based strategy that should have been mentioned earlier. Um, talking about challenges and resources, there are an abundance of resources in the employment, in, uh, I don't want to say industry, but there, there are a lot of workforce development programs out there right now. A lot of them are very successful, but they're, they're, they're almost too small, and maybe people don't always know how to get into them, they don't always know where they are, and this is where NEON can really come in because it's already connected to so many people that if it could also connect on the other end to employment and training programs, there could be a lot of flow through to connect to productive and already existing infrastructure. Um, there also, this is a lot of potential to use of campus facilities. There are already classrooms, there's computer facilities, and there are some existing funding streams. Now, challenges, one is, of course, that there's limited workforce participation now. So if people aren't working, it may seem like it's difficult to get them to work. Um, also, when you talk about employment, you don't, you don't see a building going up. You're not seeing something physical. So it can be difficult to rally around that. And it's also kind of maybe a limited payoff. Maybe people don't think that they're going to get a job in the end. Maybe people think that it's not going to go with them anywhere. So that, that's definitely a challenge. And there is talking to people a lot of pessimism about community members' abilities, motivations, maybe. And um, But talking to some other people, there's, there's also a lot of optimism that, that these programs do work, that they can work, and that really there's just not enough of them to go around. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about business development, um, what we've researched, what we found out thus far, um, and talk to you about goals, opportunities, resources, challenges, same types of things, but in this dimension. So first I want to talk about the goals. When I say business development, as Shannon said earlier, um, we are, in this case, speaking specifically about small business microenterprise, uh, growing, increasing uh, quality, quantity, and strengthening, providing support for um, Four goals we called out. Uh, the first is to promote local entrepreneurial dynamics, and that is the strengthening of um, supporting. Increasing local ownership, local ownership of businesses, and minimizing the supply and demand gap, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Uh, and then, of course, creating jobs for local residents. Again, the emphasis on local. And then all three of these together are helping to raise the residents' income level. So I want to talk a little bit about the um, type of information uh, and 
that was gathered and looked at, and then the opportunities that came out of that information. Um, you see numbers and tables in front of my team, so of course that's an obligation of ours to have those in our presentation. Um, but what I want you to see from this is that essentially uh, one of the things that the team did was look at different uh, retail categories or sectors. And through a series of calculations, flowcharts, Excel spreadsheets, determine what in the North End, what types, what quantity of retail in that category could be supported, and then what was actually on the ground now. So what you see in this table is that I will call out two categories. I want you to look at the restaurants and the apparel and services. And what you'll see is that, according to our calculations, um, the square footage of restaurants is considerably higher than what's actually on the ground now, meaning that the internal demand, the money flowing around in the North End could support more than what's actually there. Okay? And the same is true for apparel and services that there we didn't find any evidence of square footage of that informal business sector in the North End right now. So the key opportunities I want you to take away from this are that in these two sectors, um, there are relatively low barriers to starting small businesses in these two sectors. That's a positive, that's a great opportunity. Um, and I call out restaurants because that's something that we've sort of heard in our discussions and in our interviews um, with a number of people. And because they're already is some support for this. Increasing it might be more viable than trying to start up something like that. So finally, let's take a look at uh, challenges and resources that we found in our analysis. First, I'm going to go through the challenges. Um, there is, as has been mentioned before, there's a perception, a negative perception of the neighborhood, which means it would be a little more difficult, perhaps, initially, to draw uh, both people to buy the products as well people who are interested in selling the products in the North End. There's a possibility of crowding out. Once you call for the attention of the Greater Springfield area, the North End is here and it's about developing small businesses, and small business owners. You have the, uh, the uh, challenge of making sure that those incoming persons that want to start businesses are not crowding out or closing down the businesses that are already here and they're owned by local North End residents. There's also insufficient education and information, or a disconnect. I'm going to talk about some of the programs that are available right now in a second, but just know that there are some and that the information is not really meeting the people that it needs to get to. Um, this could be communication, could be language barriers, or a number of factors, but that's something that is a challenge that we have to There's also a need for models and incentives, meaning there are very few strong and uh, publicized role models of small, successful, thriving businesses owned by local residents. And the incentives for starting that type of enterprise is not readily available or readily seen. So that's something that we would have to work on in order to make a survival strategy. And finally, it's a high capital, high risk type of venture. Uh, it takes a lot of money to start up a business, as some of you I know know. Um, and then the risk is that you may or may not succeed. And you've already put a lot of money into that. Just here's A210, please. Just here's A210. Okay. Uh, just to talk quickly about the resources, the positives. Um, there are a lot of programs and uh, information, as I mentioned before. Great Springfield Chamber of Commerce, there are loan programs, uh, there's infrastructure support programs, um, and then there's also money, uh, an enterprise fund. So there are some things available. I think the next thing um, we're going to go through are some of the real estate options. Uh, so yeah, the final area of analysis that we looked at is real estate, and so by real estate we mean the physical assets of the North End, and we looked at both commercial and residential properties. Um, as you'll see, we, we tended to focus on, on residential given the opportunities that we saw, um, but we did look at both sides. Uh, and also just a word about our, our approach, we um, looked at different landlords in the neighborhood. We looked at um, data, housing data from the census, with the zoning codes, uh, so of course, talking to all of you. So we really tried to take a holistic approach to looking at, at real estate. The goals as we saw them from talking to people in the neighborhood, um, one is strengthening community control and stability. Uh, this is really a major thing, but uh, I, I think throughout our whole presentation, we'll see that a common, a common goal is just strengthening community control and real estate, in control of real estate is really a major, a major mechanism through which to do that. Uh, to develop blended properties and improve neighborhood image. 6% uh, of property in the North End is, is vacant. The state average is 
Uh, there's a lot of vacant property in the North End, and as we'll talk about a bit more, I mean, that can be a hindrance to the neighborhood, but it's also a major opportunity. Um, you know, and there's always two sides to the coin. Three is increased affordable, affordable home ownership. Uh, another figure, home ownership rates in the North End um, are about 13%. The state average is 64%. Um, that, I mean, to us, that's just striking. That's a really incredibly low home ownership, and it gets back to lack of community control. Well, yeah, the term balance of affordable market rate housing. Several people have mentioned that uh, there is clearly an unmet demand for, for housing, and I think additional analysis needs to be done on how much of that is market rate, how much is that affordable. Um, I, I think you know, there is a good amount of affordable housing in the North End. doesn't mean that there, there can't be and shouldn't be more, uh, but I think that's just something that kind of collectively we need to look at. So what means the opportunities that we see uh, in real estate? Uh, number one, developable, developable land is in supply. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, 131 parcels, um, about two thirds of which are zoned for residential use, uh, which really led us to focusing on residential real estate development. You can kind of see, um, in this map, I hope you might be able to see, but these areas in blue actually highlight where the vacant residential properties lie. Uh, as I mentioned, unmet is demand for residential space. You know, so, tons of people have told us, uh, just anecdotally, that especially in the Brightwood section, they're looking for housing. People are looking to buy, and you know the opportunities don't really exist. Uh, so that really that really says that there is, um, you know, that there there are opportunities. There is a demand for additional housing. As the map shows, that uh, these residential properties that that are vacant are spread throughout the neighborhood. Uh, you know, if you're doing commercial space, maybe that might be a hindrance because it doesn't allow consolidation, perhaps, and creating larger spaces. But for if we're looking to develop additional affordable um, home ownership, having having uh, residential vacancies spread throughout the neighborhood, especially small lot sizes, can be a real advantage. The city's a major property owner. Uh, that it's the, the city, you know, including with the Springfield Redevelopment Authority, is the major property owner, including the major property owner of vacant lands in the North End. Um, that offers a real opportunity for partnership with the city. Um, I think there, there have been some moves in that direction, but really solidifying a partnership uh, with the city would, um, would really see as a major opportunity. Public subsidies for affordable housing. Uh, Section 8, there's about, I think, 3,400 Section 8 vouchers in Springfield. The large majority of them are in the North End. I mean, that was a great investment by the city, um, by, by a real financial investment. And that's something that we certainly need to take advantage of. We understand that you know financial subsidies, that's a difficult, tricky issue. But you know, there is there is a commitment there, and it's something that can be built upon. And finally, increased tax base for the city. Uh, this is somewhat of a long a long-term uh, long-term opportunity, but by you know raising property values, by doing by implementing some of the recommendations we're going to talk about in the long term, that does increase revenues for the city. And finally, just moving into our, the challenges and resources that, that we found. Uh, number one challenge, absentee landlords. I think every single person we spoke to um, noted that absentee landlords is just a major problem. Obviously, you know, low home ownership, lots of absentee landlords. And I think that, that signifies different things. Um, on, on the one hand, this, this idea of, of lack of community control and people not being invested in their own neighborhood, which, which is, is incredibly important. And I think one of, the, one of the outcomes of that is that it's really hard to plan. If you don't have people who are invested in your neighborhood, who are homeowners, uh, who really are, are looking at um, the community's interest, it's, it's not only results in kind of blighted properties, but it also makes it really difficult to plan in a coordinated manner. Second challenge is the lack of a strong development entity. Uh, there, there are organizations doing work in the North End, but it really seems like greater cooperation is needed, and really, uh, whether it's an existing organization or perhaps a new collaboration among uh, different people, maybe people in this room, um, there needs to be made a, a stronger development organizational presence in the North, and that really has the community's interests um, as its main focus. And finally, low resident income levels. is a challenge, I mean, it's said this poorest, you know, poorest census tracts in the state, and that can be difficult to promote home ownership when people just don't have disposable income to spend um, uh, on, on homes. Uh, however, talk about there, there is funding available, and um, there, there are different levels of affordable home ownership. And I think, I, I think to be honest, that's something we need to do some more analysis on, because uh, that certainly is a challenge, but it's something that we are ready to address.
on the other side of our, of our identity scale is uh, the resources. As I mentioned, funding programs, uh, community development block grants, loan from housing tax credits, uh, Springfield Redev Redevelopment Authority. Uh, there, there, there are funding mechanisms out there. Uh, you know, the city, or, and they would already take advantage of, of many of them. And I think that's something that we can build upon. Edgewater and Pinchin Terrace, they're really, you know, there are strong affordable housing developments already in the North End. Uh, not only do they receive a lot of financial support, but they're undergoing rehabilitation, and that really does show commitment by the neighborhood and by the city um, to, to really build upon affordable home ownership. I've mentioned a lot of developable land, I think that'll be a theme. That's just a major asset, and I think we can't say that enough. It can, it can be a hindrance, it can, you know, they can be blighted properties, but it can also be a real opportunity. And, and finally, um, we have mobilized community actors. I think I can't stress this enough, is that you, know, you can have all the opportunity, you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have community will, then you know, nothing's gonna happen. And I think just you know, seeing everyone in this room and listening to all the people that we've spoken to, there's a real, real you know, strong interest and commitment and will to really uh, improve the real estate, improve the physical assets of the North End. And I think that's something that we should all keep in mind is, is cannot uh, be undervalued. So that kind of sums up our analysis um, and some of our findings. We're going to transition now into how we turn that, how we see that move into our recommendations. So uh, it's my job to now boil down all this information that's been thrown out of you to a, a rationale and a proposed action plan. And uh, I'll be using this high-tech presentation aid as I do First, I want to just, before I dive right into this, I want to say what went into our considerations when we talked about what we want to propose to you. And uh, a lot of this was very difficult because we wanted to recommend how to work on everything that everyone wants to do in economic development in the North End. But uh, there are problems with that insofar as we need to be able to produce a concrete product for you that is actionable. And um, it would just be too diffuse uh, for to be acted upon if we just said, well, we do everything. So the way we tried to narrow this down was through considerations of what activities are in and of themselves easy and difficult. Uh, with a special eye towards, are the payoffs short term or long term to this initiative or this project? Another consideration was, of course, is the capacity existing in the area high or low to actually produce results on a given project? And finally, uh, another issue was what kind of sequencing issues exist where certain projects lead logically into others and build momentum towards those others. So given that, and given the strengths and weaknesses that have already been described, um, this is a very, you know, heuristic way of looking at uh, the strength, the respective strengths and weaknesses of the different projects, but it's just to give that overall um, view that we took that there are greater strengths and weakness, uh, greater strengths and less weaknesses on the employment and real estate areas than in business development. And just to sum up, the reasons for this are that employment has programs that are in effect, that apparently work, that place people in jobs, uh, and the main challenges to expanding on that are resources. But we think that given the capacity of this group, those resources can be effectively expand, expanded as well as outreach issues addressed. In business development, there is a lot of small business activity, but the overriding constraints to this were the uh, public safety issues, uh, long-term, the issue of it being kind of a long-term project building these types of businesses, and also the issue of capture of the capital and potential crowding out effects. Also, an important note is that a lot of what can happen in employment workforce development can sequence well into business development. Finally, on the real estate, there's a lot of demonstrated enthusiasm and people are taking action on this issue right now, which is a major strength. And on the negative side, the low community stability was a concern, but it's also the concern that creates the need to work on this. So in the end, we, what we found was that these two areas were the ones that we thought it would be best for us to develop further and look at the want. That's a visual <laughs> representation. So, uh, generally speaking, uh, honing in on the workforce development and real estate areas, 
you all can read this. I won't, I won't go down and read every piece of text. But what I just want to highlight with these concepts is that focusing on workforce development is essentially starting on a path of building a comprehensive human capital strategy. And that just seems to be an overriding concern for this area. And issue number one for getting people, increasing people's income and their wealth and their ability to compete on the job market and to establish businesses is language. And so that's, that would probably be at the very start of any path toward a workforce development strategy. Uh, also important to note on workforce development is that it's just the local assets aspect of it is immediate. People's incomes are increased. That is the first outcome you have when you place people on jobs. Then moving along to uh, real estate, conceptualizing that as a strategy. That the anchor to this is that as a, it works as a good complement to the human capital side because this is about stabilizing the physical assets of the community. So what this does is it creates a good counterpoint to the human capital strategy that can create a synergy that we're both in concert can lead toward a lot of the goals that aren't the immediate primary objectives of these plans as we hope to develop them for you by the end of the semester. And I think moving along, <clears throat> how are we conceptualizing these as action plans? Workforce development as an action plan requires needs assessment of where the barriers are. Community level organization that's tied to people on the grassroots level that can take a systematic view and say where are the barriers between people and the workforce development programs and between people who have gone through the workforce development programs and getting them with. A lot of what will happen in the short term is improving on the outreach and building a coalition that can gain enough steam to increase the local resources for workforce development and deepen how workforce development is conceptualized and practiced in this area. So that means in the long term, funds will be sought in partnership with cooperative groups that will be stronger on grant applications because they represent various sectors. Curricula will be expanded and customized to the neighborhood specific issues. Collaboration with employers can build job ladders. And eventually, perhaps, the plan as it matures can build towards something where the local coalition can plan effectively to compete for desired employers, to expand the type of employment that exists here in a pre-planned way. Then in real estate, what we're suggesting is that in the short term, there need to be local discussions of what it means to stabilize the physical assets of this community. And that will involve a lot of getting everyone around the table about this, thinking about the home ownership issues, how they tie into financing issues. And then in the long term, not only acting on that stabilization plan, but thinking about how that expands outwards, how that stabilization plan leads to a better environment for business. And I believe that is all I was supposed to speak about. <laughs> so I'll pass it along to a wrap up. So uh, just to reiterate what Seth and everyone before him said is that the advantages of pursuing two tracks, employment, workforce development on one hand, real estate development on the other hand, is to really create a sense of hope in the community, really begin to turn it around. Make people feel like there is, there are resources and there is good reason to believe that they can get access to jobs and even what they're so inclined into small businesses on one hand. On the other hand, just changing the way the neighborhood looks and feels. Making people believe that they can own their own homes, that they don't have to rent from a landlord who lives in Boston or New York or nowhere. And I think that what we're really suggesting to you here today is if this is acceptable, then we need to come up very quickly with a set of ideas and steps that we need to take as a way of fleshing out 
concrete ideas and plans that then can be implemented by this group and potentially other institutional partners that you wish to invite to the table to begin to create workforce um, and employment programs that actually get people into jobs that are more than just jobs, they really are long-term careers on one hand, and get people into not just their own homes, but into good quality housing stock, into homes that will be well maintained on streets that people want to live. And so some of the ideas that we've had, I'm just going to look at the laundry list here on my notepad, for ways in which we might move forward if this basic two-track approach is acceptable to you is, we need to do more survey work. There is more research that we need to do, both in terms of inventory employers and businesses with a much finer grain of detail, and uh, also on the real estate side, actually beginning to understand individual pieces of land and some of the land assembly requirements with, again, much greater attention to detail. And on this score, there's a lot of this work that we would want to work with the North End uh, Campus Committee as well as with NEON on, for two reasons. One, it's just obviously efficient to work with you. You're in the community every day of the week. You have very strong relationships with employers and residents in the area. And it, it makes our work obviously much easier. There's another aspect to it, of course, is that if we do hit upon a set of strategies that do work, then it really makes sense to get people from this room and from your agencies involved in the process right from the get-go. Have you, as a part of the planning team, not just a part of the implementation team. So the idea there was not just doing the surveying work and the interviewing work that we need to do, but really kind of involving NEON and the campus committee in that. Possibly one of the ideas that we've thought about for creating working groups or some kind of advisory committee on these two themes uh, based on people's experience, based on their own interests, and, and uh, where they think they might be able to most effectively, or their institutions might be most able to uh, effectively contribute to forward movement. And uh, one of the other things that we think we should probably really get focused on very quickly are uh, funding opportunities, just doing a bit of basic uh, ground research, trying to think about, well, even during the planning stage, how is this process going to pay for itself? And uh, are there ways in which we can flag resources for you right now that would be easily accessible to you for you to apply for them? So I don't really want to say much more. Like I said, this is just sort of suggestions for next steps for us to take. What I wanted to do right now is to open it up uh, to a broad discussion. Um, it's just coming on to 1 o'clock, so we we definitely have plenty of time. We don't have anything else to formally present, but we're very happy to clarify anything that we have spoken about today. So you have a list of the people you've interviewed, and are they from this area, or did you interview some people from city, you know, city in general? We do have a list, and I think, uh, Andrew, off the top of the numbers. Um, yes, it's about 15 people. Actually, let me take some time. When you uh, make a comment or question, if you could please say your name first, just so I can make sure to get back to people if necessary. Okay, Tim Allen. Tim, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so it's about um, successful interviews, meaning we actually have caught up with people. Um, there are about 15. Uh, we've tried a number of others. Um, and have and it's, a, it's, a, it's to respond to your question, it's a, it's a fairly good mix. Yeah. A lot of residents and a lot of workers uh, from the community itself, but we've also reached out to people in city government as well as people in the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission at the sort of regional and state level. Um, and there are obviously more conversations around that to be had, and if there were specific people who felt that we should speak to, uh, we may have well missed them on our radar, and we definitely want to know about that. One of the, uh, my name is Jose Rosario, the principal of the Institute. One of the boys showed us a negative perception of the area. Can you want more in that area? What was the perception that people have about the, the North End? That, I think that um, is, the negative perception is under that umbrella is essentially safety issues. Um, the people that we talk to both, who, some who live here, um, others who don't, 
in talking about why they perhaps did or did not live here, the types of activities they pursued here, the issue of safety came up a lot. And I say perception because of, you know, I can't judge how real that is. I don't, you know. The comments were not as specific as that, but certainly that could link right. to it. The crime, uh, drugs. drugs. Yeah, actually, we, we heard a couple comments that said specifically we need more police. People feel about that, but people did mention that. I think there's also uh, a real sort of mix in uh, the responses that we received. Some people talked about Springfield in general having public safety concerns. Others yet singled out the North End. A lot of people qualified it saying, well, we don't know if it's true or not. It's just a sense that we have. It's a sense that other people we've spoken to have. And I think aside from public safety, there's also just the negative perception of the neighborhood as being uh, unable to really stand on, on its on its own feet. And I think that from our perspective, having actually come in and, and spent a day at, at the uh, on, on the campus, literally, that was really hard to believe. It didn't really seem qualified. Oh. I just want to say that I was I was struck in that it, it's it surprised me a little bit that you got the two things you pulled out the real estate and the workforce development they're obvious but at the same time I think it's interesting those are the two you pulled out as immediate needs being from the city of Springfield um, and certainly the the land that you were showing there under the ownership is something that's under my guise especially the Springfield Redevelopment Authority land and um, a lot of the tax title property something I said to Shonda in presentation was that you know this is one of the few neighborhoods we don't really have a housing CDC that's doing a lot of housing redevelopment in other neighborhoods, like in Hunger Hill, we have someone who is, you know, building houses and going doing this thing. We have some organizations in the area that will buy buy the land and then it's a year to two year process to get the tax credits to then do the house. So it's not an immediate construction. So that there's a lot of impatience around that. And I want to emphasize that I think that's a really important one. And I think if because we can really do. It increase the economies of scale because there's so many pieces of land, and I'm struck how we may be able to think about pulling in a developer to do a large scale, you know, single family housing drive just because there is so much to build on. We have an RFP right out right now for about 11 parcels, and I know that they're being bid on piecemeal. Um, you know, we let the neighborhood councils know that they're available, we let everyone that we possibly know that they're available, but I know we're not going to get a developer coming in and developing all of those pieces of land, but in reality, it'd be kind of nice if someone came in and had a few models of houses we really like and started just lift building a lot of stuff at once. So I think we need to rethink our strategy on how we infill these lots, and I'm certainly at the table and need help with others to come up with some good solutions for that. It's not like it hasn't been done in other places. And um, the question how workforce development was really to neon. I know that you guys go door to door in, in your neighborhood and know the needs of every resident basically in this neighborhood. Do you have any sense of your workforce, a split between how many people are there who really are not working but really want to work and really want to get those skills, and how many people, I don't know how to phrase this politely, but really aren't interested in entering the workforce? And do you get a sense of what that split is and, and, and what that looks like? I can say that a lot of from the information we've gathered that we have a lot of folks that are not working at large statistics-wise. Um, some of them are not interested, they're not. And they do their own um, hair at home, their own cooking at home that they, we did this um, survey last year with MIT. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you is that they're very interested in obtaining GED and getting skills. And because of the language barrier, it's hard to do the things that they want to do. But that's a big need and we've addressed it many times. Yeah, I, I think one of your and you proceed to collect more data, I think that's the real question. Is it the language barrier and the lack of diploma that, that, that affects the employability? And how many folks like that do we have? Is there a need to establish a vibrant adult educational or literacy piece in the North End? And what, what do we have to do to do that to get people on the employment rules? So are we really need to flush that out this reality was a fact. What, what, what does the data show us? And not, and not to be passive about it. 
know, the, I mean, people might be discouraged as could be and say, oh, I don't want to work. But really, they, there's there's lots of reasons for people to want to. And if we're not passive about it, that that will take hold. Also, just to touch on the case, um, uh, an example is Lydia from the school uh, gets together uh, someone to come in and teach the ESL. And 50 parents showed up for that one time. So there is a need for us. Just to tap on that, um, we ran the, the classes last year, and we had a church group which has had five months to run the program. Out of that fun, um, five months, we ended up having another 30 assigned you know, that came in and registered. This year, when we did the information night, we ended up with 50. But we have another 60 that, from last week up to now, that came in and registered for the ESL class. So that is a big need. Another thing is that we're working on getting the GED, the classes. We, uh, we're working on for the process of it. Now, we're going to have the GED, the classes given in Spanish, and take the test in Spanish. And this way, it'll bring up your self-esteem, then feel more confident, then they will come to the ESOL classes, and then this way we can help them with job placement and assisting them on other, other needs that they have. I'm Alan Blair from the Economic Development Council. I'm just curious about the uh, work <coughs> the capacity comments that you made about organizations that are put in place to assist with workforce development. Um, and what your assessment is of, uh, of organizations that have been in place a long time and seem to be uh, well-funded and with a lot of capacity. And I'm thinking about MCDI, for example, as a place that does a lot of ESO and there's a long history of that. Is it a capacity issue there, uh, or is it that it's not, it's, there's a disconnect between this neighborhood and that facility? Why isn't that being used more frequently, more often? I, I think that the, what, what I hear about parents is it's local. It's, it's in walking distance. Um, we also have the child care provider. Um, they can come, they can bring their child, they don't have to worry about doing their child at home. Um, they can come in. The other thing is, um, you, you kind of give them a more likely friendly welcome so that they can come, that they can feel that this is the neighborhood school, you're welcome to come here. So not only that we have this area, but you know, like the parents from Harena and from Brightwood, we all connect. So this has become a place where they feel that it's more comfortable. And it just uh, then kind of leads you to ask how can you decentralize some of these services that have been kind of pulled together for efficiency purposes in one central location so that they are more accessible and what are the corresponding costs of doing that because there is a, obviously going to be a cost of doing that to facilitate. So work for, workforce development there is um, always something that I um, is near and dear to me. Number one, health care. Um, we have uh, we've discussed. We have so many people in this community who actually know how to who know how to be caregivers, and we have a tremendous need for caregivers. That's in medical health care. That's in home health care. That's in actually daycare as well. And uh, that is a resource in this community. People who have spent their lives and have become incredibly wonderful caregivers, but. There's a part of that that we've not done, and that's the development of that, and the, uh, the training in that, and the focusing in that, and the, the view of that as entry into other things. We haven't done it. I, I, I know that as far as um, personal care attendance, several million dollars a year are paid to people in this community who are personal care attendants for others. It's quite extensive. It's very important. We have to capture it, understand it, build on it, and, and use it as a jumping off point for, th for things. I mean, that's the particular thing I know about. But how about in education? I mean, if we don't have, you know, if you can't look at our schools and say, hey, why aren't there more people in the classroom? That's another thing that really needs to happen, more people in the classroom. And, and it doesn't have to be 
uh, everybody with master's degrees. I mean, there's plenty of room for other people from the community who start getting skills and then look at that as a, as a way to move forward. Same with daycare. We have home daycare providers. We have institutional daycare providers. People can come, they can learn, they can, they can learn how to do well and learn child development, and then that leads to the next step as well. We need to focus, and um, th those are just the examples that come to me because I can see them every day. One of the points that was put up under uh, workforce development that I found intriguing was the, the notion that, that by uh, creating a, uh, a skilled workforce, that you would be a competitive place to attract companies who need that kind of workforce. And uh, that's kind of an interesting strategy to have, uh, for one thing. But, but in terms of today's reality, you already have a demand in the market, which is in healthcare and um, to a large degree is in healthcare. So just reversing that process a little bit and designing programs that prepare people for those, for those jobs and, uh, and increasing the, the awareness around the value of those jobs might be the incentive that people need to get engaged in the training. You know, a lot of the training, sometimes without the immediacy of a job at the end of the training program, uh, is discouraging for people to enter because they're not sure of the, pay, the payback for the effort. And here, you almost have a short payback for the effort. You know? Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions. Tim Allen again. Um, we worked with Rosa a couple of years ago on putting that adult basic ed program together, and it was an eye-opener to me uh, that the need for adult basic ed and the, the, the amount, the percentage of the need that is met is about the lowest thing I've ever heard in this society. It's about 4%. So to talk about employment possibilities for people without focusing on adult basic ed and increasing those services at an alarming rate, um, is, so I hope you include that, some, some discussion of that in your study. That's definitely, if, if that didn't come through in the presentation, then it was definitely something we've been discussing previous to presenting in front of you, is that a lot of this has to do with just that. So that's on our minds. Okay. And, and the second part is one thing that I've learned in the last couple of years in Step Up Springfield and working with the Latino community. And something you didn't speak of, because you're speaking of the North End, the geographic area, which is largely Latino, is that the cultural issues you didn't really discuss. And I'm not sure how much you should discuss them or how much you shouldn't, but it's a very relationship-based culture, which doesn't respond very well to typical institutional solutions. That's my, those are my words, and I hope I'm not offending anyone. But I, I think those kind of things need to be in your report and maybe Maybe you should talk to some people in the North End specifically about that. Because we found that, that there are certain characteristics in the, in the Puerto Rican culture that are different in other, than in other cultures. And how society responds to that is important if we're going to try to raise the, the, the level of water in the harm. I just wanted to make a comment, and then I wanted to ask you a follow-up question to what you said. Colleen, I just want to add to what Tim was just saying. I think one of the concerns we have is very clearly based on the message, the, the distribution of the message, and who is the recipient of that message. That is really, I think, at the heart of a little bit of what Tim was talking about, I can presume to interpret. But that, I think that's also very, very critical for us to be effective in helping to be part of the solution. Alan, I wonder if you could speak to your experience in a little detail. What are the ways in which you've been able to overcome that sense that some of the traditional institutional setups don't work for this neighborhood? Well, I'm on a big learning curve, and some people could tell, could you know, could certainly validate that in here because I work with some people in here, and I don't profess to have solutions, but I, I do feel that. Um, you know, Alan offered the MCDI solution, and Rose's response was, it's not close. And that, I can't, I can't magnify that answer enough. Um, that uh, that's a wonderful MCDI, and 
read on one or board. They're all wonderful solutions, but if people don't feel like they know what they are, or that they can personally relate, or that there aren't steps that somehow show that if I do this, then I do this, then I do this, then I do this, and then that opportunity might be available to me. Without that type of coaching and mentoring and understanding of where people are, we're going to still have a gap. And um, I, I'm not, probably not giving you good examples. Peter, Jeff, other people who live in this community, work in this community, could certainly do a better job than me. Uh, Rosa, Milta, but those are my perceptions of <coughs> that I think are worth probably a little more investigation. I think you need to also investigate how the state uh, divvied out the money for adult education this time. And what happened to the institutions that applied for that money uh, this time. And MCDI clearly uh, guarded the major portion of the funding for school food. And so some <coughs> players who were the traditional adult education providers who were culturally connected to the community were left out. And that's a significant institution that was left out this time, and there's been no resolve on how to get them back in. And that's, that's important. Can we, um, I'd like to uh, pick up on something that Katie said, um, and, to, and, and go over to the um, real estate aspect, which I think we would leave alone. <laughs> If we could, um, there's a lot of property. Um, Katie was saying something about uh, blitz developing or getting uh, large groups to develop. But really, what about community-based uh, planning for that property? Community-based control over that property. It's a tremendous problem for us. You, you know, you can't really move ahead. It, it, if things were going better, haphazard community development would, would be okay because the, the, the environment around that haphazard development would dictate what's happening. We need, to, we need to figure out how to get control over those properties or how to get control over what kind of developments hap, hap, development happens in those properties. And sort of instead of the first thing being blitz development, how about helping us figure out how to get control over it? I know that other places have done it. In Dudley Street, they actually figured out a way to do it and implemented it, and it is a success for all of us to look at today. Um, there are uh, community development corporations that could take the lead on that, new ones or established ones, but anyone that was who has the North End development in, in, as their first priority. And there are other things. I mean, we talked to, um, we've talked with Gus Newport about, and, and with, uh, and SAU was uh, working on uh, community land trusts. I don't know, a co I don't know what the best way to do that is. But if we could get started with a strategy of how to capture that land that needs to be developed and then start developing it as a, um, it, with a plan. I mean, I think that's where we need to start. This is I not so that. different than, than happened 30 years ago. Yeah, I agree with you. I guess my, my original plan was I don't think we have a local CDC or something set up right now that can do that, but I guess I'm but let's we do need it. one. Yeah, exactly. My, we need one because that is the first step we have to take so that we do have the local control. I meant a big builder would implement it, but that, yes, right. we do need a CDC to start And, and, and we need to, and, and, and actually we have the, that in this neighborhood. It, those scattered properties and, and the history of what Dudley Street did might give us some good some good lessons. I I don't know if they all apply. But. Just a couple of other things that have been discussed in this regard. This the housing issue has been discussed in uh, depth very recently over the past three or four months and in several neighborhoods in the city, not just the North End, but it applies obviously here um, uh, very well. And and one of the one of the issues discussed often is the need for code enforcement, so the properties that do exist today are up to code, and that, that has a way of putting pressure on absentee landlords to make sure that they are forced to be up to code and rents and other things kind of uh, rise to the levels they should be in order for them to support the, the structure 
that encourages other development because it increases land values and encourages those others to make investments. That's one point. Another point to just keep in mind as you look at this is that the city has this overarching imperative to raise revenue. And, and the disposition of these vacant parcels is, uh, is being viewed, I think, both as a means of regenerating the neighborhood, but also recapturing some revenue lost through the tax title procedures and otherwise. So that the effect of, uh, of, a, of a community development organization that we created to acquire, control, plan, and so on, would have to be done in this in this environment of acute pressure on revenue, which is one of the reasons why you go out to bid and hope that the market will increase the values and you maximize uh, the revenue. So that's the backdrop for the, the current environment that we're in in the city. And that affects a lot of the decisions being made. So we, have to, we have to keep in mind the other thing that you've told us is that if we have 13% home ownership and then you throw everything out to bid, we'll wind up with 5% home ownership. So then, that, that, we're, no, we're going nowhere that way. We go nowhere without home ownership. We go nowhere without safe streets. And we go nowhere without our kids being educated. Nowhere. And if, if economic development doesn't have a basis in those things, you know, we're... we're so Jeff, let me say, all the properties we put out for bid for the SRA and the tax title are required to be home ownership units. And everything we've got out to bid right now is required in a single family home requiring home ownership right. and we require to approve of all design site plans etc of every unit so that you know they're building attractive housing so at least there is a level of control yes. now it's through city hall but certainly the planning department's making sure that it is it is increasing home ownership and ownership over the neighborhood and we can always be grateful for the work that the planning department has done for us in this neighborhood there's no question about it but we, we can just, only do it on a small scale it's we just need of time we just need to think about the future yep. and taking this neighborhood from where it is to one that has um, more of the things that will allow our, our folks to, to live better lives. We have to do that. I think from our perspective as a class, this conversation is, is really exciting and sort of reinforces and underscores the need to create some kind of an advisory group just on real estate. I think that there was much less of a diversity of opinion. I think there was much more convergence on what to do on education and, and workforce development. But I think creating community control as well as a solid asset base for the community is much more complex in some senses. What the right balance of political and economic strategies might be, where there might exist statutory opportunities um, really would require us to have a little more guidance. So again, I just want to suggest that from our perspective, this is one way to move forward, is to really begin to bring together people from at least this room on this one question, and we will work with you as effectively as we can.